Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 902 of the Juice Box Podcast. I just got back from a weekend long speaking event, and we do not want to waste this deepness in my voice from the soreness I'm having in my throat. Let's use it right here, shall we? On today's episode of the Juice Box Podcast, Today, I'll be speaking with Jesse. She goes by Glucose Goddess on Instagram and other places. Jesse is the author of the book Glucose Revolution and her brand new book, which comes out today, May 2nd, Glucose Goddess Method, a four week guide to cutting cravings, getting your energy back, and feeling amazing. While you're listening today, please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan. For becoming bold with insulin. If you have type 1 diabetes or are the caregiver of type 1 and are a U.S. resident, please take a few moments to go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box and complete their survey. When you complete that survey, you are supporting type 1 research, you're helping yourself, and you're supporting the juice box podcast. t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box. I wish you could all hear how deep my voice sounds in these headphones. Juice Box Podcast. T1D Exchange, the glucose goddess. It's echoing in my ears. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by AG1 from Athletic Greens. You can have AG1 just like I do every morning a little bit of water, a delicious scoop of AG1, and you're on your way. Athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. Get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs at my link when you make your first order. Today's podcast is also sponsored by the Omnipod 5, tubeless algorithm-based pumping with the Omnipod 5. It's insane. Listen how deep I go. Get an Omnipod 5. I command you. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Don't want an algorithm? Get the Omnipod dash. Same link. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. My daughter has been wearing an Omnipod every day since she was four years old. She'll be 19 this summer. Tubeless insulin pumping with Omnipod cannot be beat. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com to Athletic Greens, Omnipod, and all the sponsors. When you use my links, you're supporting the show. Hi, Scott. My name is Jesse Interspe. I'm a biochemist by trade, and I became somewhat of a scientific vulgarizer in the world of glucose science. So now I spend my days teaching as many people as possible about glucose, how it affects our body, our mind, and then easy tips that are all science-backed so that everybody can learn to manage it better. Okay. What did you go to, I know what you just said you did, but what did you go to school for? How, like, how did you so, get to this? So I started by studying mathematics after high school because I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Like I had no passions, nothing. So my stepdad told me, give me a really good piece of advice. He said, if you don't know what to do, do the hardest thing you can. So I thought the hardest thing is math. So I went to study math in undergrad and I hated it. But um, it was a, it was actually a really good move because then a few years later, when I discovered I wanted to you know, be in this space of in the field of health, I could then go and do it. You know, mm -hmm. if I had studied history and then been like, oh my God, I want to be a biochemist, that transition would have been much harder. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, my son just graduated from his undergrad about a year oh, ago. Congrats. Oh, thank you. And it was the same thing as he left for school. We we're like, what do you want to do? And he said, play baseball. And we were like, is there anything else? Because, <laughs> you know, and um, he's just very math minded. So he got a quantitative econ degree, which cool. I, I don't think he enjoyed any moment of. And, mm -hmm. um, but it came, uh, most naturally to him, I think. Yeah. So um, I, I take your point. And so you were with this mathematics background, you were able to what go to grad school? Yes. So in my in my second year of, of math, I have an accident, I break my back jumping off a waterfall. So that just completely changed my life. I started suffering like crazy physically, but mostly mentally, like my mental health went really, really dark. Mm -hmm. And I was 19. And at that point, I just realized, okay, like I need to understand how my body and my mind work. I need to understand this machine. Otherwise, like 
living is getting really difficult. So I thought to myself, hey, I'm going to go study the body. I'm going to go study how this machine works, this machine that had become sort of a black box to me. So that's when I decided I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to study biochemistry. So I moved to the US. I was in London at the time. I go to Georgetown to do grad school for biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to go even deeper into health and what was at the forefront at the time. So I moved to San Francisco and I work in the field of genetics for five years, understanding our DNA, et cetera. But, you know, I mean, that was all very interesting, but I was a little bit disappointed because I thought that DNA was going to be much more helpful to me. I thought that if I understood my DNA, I was going to be able to figure out precisely what I needed to do every day to feel good and to get my mental health back. But that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. But while I was there, that's when I discovered glucose. And that's when things really started changing for me. So what's the first thing that you noticed back then that makes you think this is worth focusing on? So, you know, in Silicon Valley, people are always testing technologies, um, just trying to test everything out there. And so a pilot study was put in place at the company I was working at. And this pilot study was offering five employees to wear a CGM, a Medtronic CGM, as people without diabetes mm -hmm. to sort of like test the technology and see the applications that were happening, you know, in athletes, in personalized nutrition, et cetera. So I raised my hand. I, do, I don't know why. I just felt very drawn to it. And I raised my hand and starts a big, big deep dive into this data, this world. And I start realizing, Scott, that the days I have the most spikes and the most, you know, of a variable glucose, the worse my mental health is. And I see a very clear pattern. You know, me as a person without diabetes who never thought for one second that I would, you know, that this was appropriate for me or useful, I started really learning a lot about my body and myself. And it truly helped me start the healing process. And because I'm a scientist, you know, I, I dove into all the scientific papers I could find on the topic. Um, and I found that I wasn't alone, that even in people who don't have diabetes, you know, you can still be experiencing spikes that can still have consequences and lead to symptoms mm -hmm. and impact your physical and mental health. So then I went super deep dive and now it's all I talk about all day. <laughs> when you talk about <laughs> mental health impacts from a blood sugar spike, for example, mm -hmm. you mean just from like, wh what is the range from moodiness to short tempered to like, is that what you expect to see with a higher blood sugar? Yeah. So the more spikes and drops you have, um, the lower your tyrosine levels in your brain are going to be. And tyrosine is something that regulates your mood. And so you might see more moodiness, um, more anger. Some studies are showing that the more variable your glucose is, the more you're going to snap um, towards, you know, people in your family, your partner, the more you're going to want to punish people around you. Um, and then, you know, I mean, the more spikes you have, even without diabetes, the more you're going to experience symptoms of anxiety and depression if you're prone to that. And this is all from the scientific studies, right? I'm not inventing anything. This is what I saw in the papers. And then long-term brain fog is a very common symptom of a lot of glucose spikes. Sure. Because your neurons, you know, the more spikes there are, the more inflammation there is, and then you feel it as brain fog. And then super long-term, we're now starting to see a lot of connections between glucose and dementia. So I was like, whoa, the brain is really connected to what I'm eating through this variable of glucose. And it was like a, it was a real revelation for me, you know, because for 10 years I had been in a state where I didn't understand at all how to make my mental health better. I was like completely clueless about why I was having these episodes of feeling like I left my body and feeling super anxious. And now I started to find a clue mm -hmm. and that really fascinated me. Well, it's interesting to hear somebody who doesn't, who has a functioning pancreas, right? To say that fluctuations help. Because I mean, what's a fluctuation when you, for you? I mean, what would a high blood sugar have been? Like 150, 160? The highest I've ever been was like 190. Um, but after eating like a whole box of cookies, right? Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was the highest I ever got. Um, but I heard from a lot of people who have diabetes that they were quite surprised that somebody with a functioning pancreas could even get that high, right? Yeah. Like, so we're discovering that glucose is you know very variable and depending on your body depending on what's going on you can see readings that are technically you know that we used to think that people with that diabetes could not touch mm -hmm. so yeah 190 i got mm -hmm. to 
I wore a CGM like a two years ago. And this one night I just went online. I said to people, I'm like, all right, like I, I actually, I made my chart available live to people. Oh, nice. And I was like, all right, tell me what to eat. Yeah, you know, and I ordered a pizza and yeah. a slice of pizza didn't really touch me. Two slices crept up at three slices. I got into the 150s, 160s, and then I started throwing like sugared candy on top of it. And it held on for hours before it would mm-hmm. go away. Um, but then I was interested with some things like uh, uh, breakfast cereal, which is, I mean, I don't even think it's really food, right? But if you have type 1 diabetes or type 2 and you're using insulin and you have a meter, you see how hard it hits you, right? And I was surprised that I couldn't eat enough breakfast cereal to get my blood sugar to go up. Really? But I still felt the same way I felt when I ate the pizza. Like, sort of just like, uh, you know, like, like, why did I do that? Like, you know, that feeling of like, you That know. could be the dopamine crash, right? It could be like the sugar releases dopamine in your brain. And then, you know, an hour later, you start getting withdrawal syndrome, basically, mm. from the dopamine. And that can make you feel really, really bad. Okay. So you... So first of all, you mentioned tyrosine, which I don't understand. It's an amino acid. Yeah, it's also it's it's used in the brain essentially to regulate mood, and this is one of the theories that scientists have to connect variable glucose levels and mood. They think, oh, it maybe it's because the more variable your blood sugar is, the more tyrosine is being impacted, and they think that maybe that's then why it affects your mood. Okay, and then you mentioned dementia. Um, mm-hmm. later on is that sort of why they call alzheimer's diabetes type what do they call it diabetes type, type three. three right it is so for a long time we thought alzheimer's is you know based on this plaque um this plaque thing and now we're starting to see actually it might be the case that alzheimer's is actually just the cells in your brain experiencing insulin resistance so experiencing type 2 diabetes but in the brain Hmm. right of like your cells not being able to get energy into them anymore and of increased inflammation and glycation that happens the more glucose spikes you have so now it seems that alzheimer's is actually very linked to glucose into your food into your lifestyle right and i think actually last week i can't remember i think the first person somebody got diagnosed with alzheimer's disease and they were 19 years old and this was like you know the first ever 19 year old with alzheimer's a bit like back in the day when we thought type 2 diabetes was adult onset diabetes Mm -hmm. and now we can see it even in children so the more our food landscape is evolving and the less we really know how to eat to keep our body um, thriving, the more these symptoms and conditions are becoming prevalent. And what I try to do, Scott, is really just teach people about like, okay, how what happens when you eat? How do different types of food impact your glucose levels? And then easy things you can do to really manage that and avoid harming your health too much long term. What is the what is the action that happens? So like, you know, this is a I, I, w- I wouldn't call this common sense, but I think everyone knows they eat too, a bunch of food and they're like, oh, I don't feel good afterwards. And then you, you do it again, right? And so is there a is there a function internally that makes us, because like, we all talk about it, like, oh, you eat sugar, you want more sugar, you eat carbs, you want yeah. more carbs. So does that, how does that actually work? So there's this uh, molecule in your brain called dopamine, and it's called also the pleasure molecule. And it's the same molecule, you 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 get dopamine in your brain. Your brain releases dopamine when you eat something sweet. And that molecule of pleasure, dopamine, also gets released when you have sex, when you play like the casino, when you do illegal drugs. Like that substance is highly addictive to the brain. And that's why sugar is addictive. And that's why when you don't feel good, maybe you're having, you know, a difficult day, a difficult week, like you feel, or you're tired, you feel like, oh, I'm going to have something sweet because that's going to make me feel better. What you're after is that dopamine feeling. But a lot of people, Scott, confuse that feeling with energy. They think, oh, you know, this can- this this cookie is giving me energy because you kind of feel a bit perked up. You're like, whoa, your brain gets, you feel like your brain is waking up. That's just pleasure. That's just dopamine. That's not actually energy. Mm-hmm. And when we eat something sweet, we're actually hurting our cells' ability to make energy effectively. And so there's this big, you know, myth around sugar in the morning for breakfast is going to give you energy for the day. And that's just not the case. It gives you pleasure for a little bit, but actually it hurts your body's ability to make energy on the inside. Hmm. So over years, you're having cereal for breakfast with orange juice, yet you feel more and more tired. You know, playing with your kids is exhausting. 
carrying the groceries up the stairs is exhausting, but you keep eating this sugar. And it's because on the inside, all that sugar and all those glucose spikes are harming your mitochondria. The mitochondria are the powerhouses of your cells, responsible for turning glucose into energy. But when we, when we eat too much sugar and we give too much glucose to these little mitochondria, they kind of break down. Mm -hmm. So over time, eating a lot of sugar equals chronic fatigue, which is counterintuitive. You're also oddly describing every addiction too, right? Yeah. Like you've, you, you have a feeling that's a baseline. You're going for something that feels bigger and mm -hmm. then suddenly your body can't sustain that. So your artificial input has to get bigger and bigger and bigger to get a, a lesser and lesser return. And eventually Absolutely. your body just kind of gives up. Yeah. Yeah. You, you become accustomed to it, right? Mm -hmm. You become resistant. It's like coffee, right? Like when I first started drinking coffee, I would have a half an espresso and I'd be wired for 12 hours. And now, you know, I need a couple cups of coffee to really feel an effect because my body has gotten used to it. And so your body is very good at getting used to things, but then that can have negative side effects. Right. I've never had coffee. Ever in your life? Yeah, everybody who listens knows, but yeah, I've never had coffee. <gasps> I, my wow. parents drank it so much when I was growing up, like the smell of it's disgusting to me. And I also commingle it in my head with cigarettes because my dad smoked. But now it's a thing, like you can never, ever drink coffee in your life. It would never occur to me to try it. Wow, it, it's it's very It is very strange. There's a couple of things I've never done that throw me off. Um, and You like chocolate? Uh, I will use... <laughs> I hope everybody heard me say use. I buy uh, a, a certain brand of chocolate chips and I buy some milk chocolate and some dark chocolate. I mix them together in a container. And when I need something sweet, I take a few of them. Mm. But I don't, to say that I like chocolate is not fair. Like I like chocolate, sure. But I don't eat it because I'm like, oh, chocolate. I eat it yeah. because it's a, I know it's a kick and I don't get stuck snacking on it. Mm. Whereas if I if I wanted like a sweet kick and I went to a hard candy, yeah, I would just keep eating them. Interesting. So I know that about myself. So I try to. So you know that chocolate is a safer place to get some dopamine because it's somehow less addictive to you yes. than dopamine from candy. That is what I have figured out. <laughs> because if That's I awesome. like bought a box, let me just I'll let you into my mind. If I stopped at a gas station and bought a box of Red Hots or something like that that's just pure sugar, in twenty minutes the whole box would be gone. Do you think chocolate kind of makes you a little bit nauseous at the same time, so you don't want to eat too much of it, or like there's something about it that you don't really like? Um, I don't. I don't enjoy the. Um, this is so weird. I don't enjoy the thickness that my saliva gets when I eat chocolate, so I don't want to keep eating it because of that. Interesting. Yeah. So I stop my. Wow. I, so I. I. It's basically. I've basically found heroin that I can't stand doing. <laughs> you you wow. know what I mean. So it stops me at some point. Yeah, Amazing. That's all. Uh, I also have trouble like um, digesting food. I've uh, recently in the last year added a digestive enzyme to my my mm. maintenance and um, a magnesium oxide. So I learned this through my daughter who has type one. She's almost 19 now, um, but she was not eliminating on a regular schedule and her stomach would hurt very badly. Mm. Um, and, you know, we did all of the kind of I, I want to say like normal doctoring things you would do about something like this. We, you know, we went to all the doctors we were supposed to, and we ended up at a gastro who just told us that she had gastroparesis. But that's of course a very scary word to someone who has diabetes versus if off the street, I just said, Hey, you digest food slowly. So uh, luckily there's a, a CDE that comes on the show a lot and she's had uh, diabetes for 30 years and she and I were talking privately and she's like, you know, I'm not a doctor, but Arden doesn't have gastroparesis, like something's going on. And we tried an elimination diet that did not help her at all. And we finally, I just sort of like took over one day and I said, I'm going to have you take these digestive enzymes at every meal. And she started taking them and her stomach stopped hurting when she ate, but yeah. she still wasn't going to the bathroom. So we added the magnesium oxide, which got everything moving. And then once she had a cycle that was happening every day, we started putting in a probiotic. And she's in a completely different world now. Wow. It, it, Congratulations it cleared, yeah, on finding that. Yeah, it cleared her acne. It um, Her stomach doesn't hurt. She goes to the bathroom. She eliminates every day. Um, and then I realized, I'm like, but I, I've struggled with that my whole life. Like, I thought of it for her because she has type 1, and I figured maybe her pancreas wasn't helping with the digestion. But then I'm like, I, I have the same problem. I, I have trouble digesting protein. 
Like, I can't take in oils. It took me my whole adult life to figure out not to eat oil. Um, and then when I eliminated all that, like, things would get better and better, but I would never ascend to a place where I thought, like, oh, this is good still. You know, like, I was having to add fiber to my meals and things like that. And um, the magnesium and the enzyme together have, like, have like changed my life, too. It's very interesting. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so this is kind of cool. So what do you tell, like, I know we're going to get to the part where we're going to try to figure, we're going to try to apply what you talk about to people who are using insulin. But for now, Mm -hmm. like when you talk about this, when you stand in front of a group or you get on a podcast, what are the things you want people to know? I want people to know that learning about their glucose levels, whoever they are, and learning to manage it can help them regardless of, you know, their life. Maybe they have type one, maybe they have type two, maybe they have difficult mental health, maybe they don't sleep well, maybe they have fertility issues, Mm -hmm. which is very linked to glucose. Maybe they have psoriasis, eczema, difficult menopause symptoms. Like we now know from the scientific studies that essentially if your glucose levels are very variable, it can lead to many different symptoms in your body. And learning these easy hacks to manage it can really make a difference. And so that's the first place I start. And then I teach people all the hacks that scientists across the world have discovered. A lot of the times by studying people, by studying people with type one first and finding that these hacks are working. And so I talk about the hacks. So let me go into the hacks because that's really the the meat of it all. Yeah, I want to hear. Okay, so first hack. Omnipod is an insulin pump. It is a tubeless insulin pump, and there are two of them to choose from. You can get yourself the Omnipod Dash, which is an absolutely terrific pump where you put in your settings and then make all of your decisions. And then there's the Omnipod 5, where you put in your settings and then the algorithm makes decisions for you. You tell it how much you've eaten, it handles the insulin. Your blood sugar tries to go down, it handles the insulin. Your blood sugar tries to go up, it handles the insulin. It's based on an algorithm called Smart Adjust Technology. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. So maybe you want the Omnipod Dash? Use my link to get started. You have a G6 and you want to try the Omnipod 5? Use my link to get started. Use my link to learn more. Use my link to reach out to Omnipod and say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. They'll get back to you. You can start a dialogue. Figure out what's best for you. Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. When you get to that link, you're going to be met by a photo of me, but don't let that deter you. At least you'll know you're in the right place. Then you can just scroll down a little bit, do your reading and your learning. You can check on your coverage. You can click to talk to an Omnipod specialist. Eh, trust me, this is, the, this is the place you want to be if you're looking for Omnipod. What's next? Athletic Greens makes something called AG1. That's what you're looking for. AG1 from Athletic Greens. I'm going to tell you about my experience with it. I had a lot of trouble with all of the other green drinks that I tried before AG1. Trouble meaning I hated the way they tasted and I couldn't get them down. But I have absolutely no trouble drinking Athletic Greens. I don't just mean I don't have trouble. I mean, it's a pleasurable, easy experience. I begin every morning with a scoop of Athletic Greens in some water. Actually, they send you a nice little uh, shaker that you can shake it up in and drink it down. And my day is on its way. I take Athletic Greens for vitamins and nutrition that I don't think I'm otherwise getting in my diet. You may have another reason. I can feel a crispness in my uh, step. What is that, a skip in my step? I don't know exactly what I feel. I feel better when I drink Athletic Greens every day, I think is what I'm trying to tell you athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. Get started today with AG1 using my link and you'll also receive a year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order. AG1 contains less than one gram of sugar. No GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. That's why it tastes so good. It supports better sleep quality and recovery, mental clarity and alertness, And like I said, I just feel crisper when I'm using it. I don't exactly know what that means, but there's a crispness to me. Tons of people taking some kind of multivitamins every day. It's important to choose one that has high quality ingredients, stuff that your body will actually absorb. 
athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. Get started today. Get that free vitamin D, the travel packs. You won't be sorry. There are links in the show notes of the audio app you're listening in right now and links at juiceboxpodcast.com. If you can't remember, omnipod.com forward slash juice box and athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. All right, let's get to Jesse's tips and the rest of our conversation. You can find her on Instagram, by the way. I'll put the information at the end. First hack, have a savory instead of a sweet breakfast. So we just talked about dopamine and energy, right? The myth that sugar in the morning is going to give you energy is just, it's not true. If you have a breakfast that's just something sweet or something starchy, which most of us have, right? Whether it's like bread with jam, maybe it's fruit juice, maybe it's breakfast cereal, maybe it's oats with some honey, a banana, If you're just having sweet and starchy foods for breakfast, you're going to create a big glucose spike in your body. And we want to kind of avoid the big spike in the morning because then even in people without diabetes, it will deregulate your glucose for the rest of the day. So instead, you want to switch to a breakfast that is built around protein, what I call a savory breakfast. Mm -hmm. So protein, some fat, some fiber if you can. And if you want something sweet, have like a piece of whole fruit for taste. Right. But in the morning, it's really important to have a savory breakfast to set your glucose up for the day. So that's hack number one. And it's really kind of like a pillar of steady glucose levels. If you don't have that, it's going to be really hard to to steady things. Before we move on, can you tell people what, what the difference is between eating a piece of fruit and having jelly on their toast? Absolutely. So first of all, I want people to know something very important about fruit. So the fruit that you see today in supermarkets, like you might think, oh, it's natural. It's good for me. It comes from plants. The thing is, the fruit that we see today in supermarkets has been actually bred for centuries by humans to be extra sweet and extra juicy to give us more of that dopamine hit. So a little bit like humans bred gray wolves into chihuahuas. They've bred ancestral bananas into the bananas you see today. If you look at how fruit was a million years ago, it was not sweet at all, very difficult to eat, very fibrous, very, you know, dense and and difficult to chew. So all this to say that the fruit you see today in supermarkets has been manufactured. That being said, Scott, in a piece of fruit, yes, there is some sugar, but there's also a very, 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 very important substance called fiber. And fiber is what you find in most fruits and vegetables. And fiber, as you probably know, when we digest it, it doesn't turn to glucose. It doesn't increase your glucose levels. Actually, it's very protective. Fiber makes a mesh in your upper intestine, sort of like protective shield. Uh, And it stays there for a couple of hours. And then it prevents your body from absorbing too much glucose. It's very, very important to eat enough fiber when you're having also sugar to prevent that glucose spike. So all this to say that if you want to eat something sweet, a piece of whole fruit is always going to be the best thing to eat because it has that protective fiber. Now the issue arises when we denature a piece of fruit, when we juice it, for example, and we get rid of the fiber, when we turn it into jam, which is also getting rid of the fiber, concentrating the sugar, maybe adding some table sugar on top of that. Mm Um, Or when we dry fruit, you know, when we dry mango, we're actually reducing the amount of water in the mango. So we're concentrating, again, the sugar, concentrating that dopamine hit. So whole fruit is fine, but any sort of derivative product, fruit juice, fruit jam, fruit puree, all that stuff, we should consider that dessert, right? It's really, it's a dessert. It's like having a piece of cake or some chocolate. It's really not something that is health promoting. Mm -hmm. Right. It gives us dopamine, but it's not helpful to our health. So that's really, really key. Because for a long time, you know, I thought as long as it comes from fruit, it's good for my body. Right. No, I know. I, I, uh, Jenny is a person I do a lot of episodes with, and she's always saying, like, don't drink juice. Like, don't, yes, don't drink fruit juice. And Absolutely. it's just terrible. And the glycemic hit from it is insane. 
Um, yeah. And it, it's devoid of anything valuable at that point, right? Exactly. Yeah. And another hack I have is like, okay, so in the morning you want to avoid eating sweet foods and you want to make a breakfast that's built around protein. Um, and in my book, I have lots of cool recipes, but also I want to teach people how to eat sugar in a way that's less impactful on their glucose level. So how do you eat sugar in a way that creates a smaller spike? Because I want the pleasure. I don't want to stop eating chocolate. I love chocolate, mm -hmm. right? How do we eat it in a way that doesn't cause too many side effects on our glucose and on our body? So another hack is when you eat something sweet, make sure it's never on an empty stomach. Instead, make sure it's after a meal as dessert, okay. right? So if you if you want to have your favorite cookie, don't have it first thing in the morning or between meals. Have it after your lunch or after your dinner. That way you get all the pleasure from it with less of an impact on your glucose levels. I'm going to write down no cookies for breakfast. <laughs> exactly. and that's because your stomach is why what's the value in that because when so let's take the states where there's nothing in your stomach so maybe mm -hmm. you just woke up in the morning right your body is really empty your stomach is empty your intestines are really empty so if you eat something that's high in sugar well that let's say a cookie it's going to go really quickly from your mouth to your stomach to your intestine to then your bloodstream. Nothing is slowing it down. Nothing is stopping it. It just goes straight through like roof. Yeah. And then big increase in glucose levels in your blood very quickly. On the contrary, if you have something sweet after you've had already a meal, let's say, I don't know, like some chicken, some broccoli, some rice, like a full meal, that meal is sitting in your stomach, right? Mm -hmm. And that meal is going to slow down how quickly the cookie is going to arrive into your intestine and into your bloodstream. And... One important thing as well that I think a lot of people can relate to is the more spikes you have, the more you're going to have these very intense hunger moments. You know, if you don't have, even if you don't have diabetes, you're going to feel a lot of cravings from a glucose crash. And by eating sugar after a meal instead of on an empty stomach, you can really reduce those cravings that come on a couple of hours after a meal. And cravings are the dopamine dwindling and your body yeah. going, let's do that again, right? Good question. Yeah. It's actually is multifactorial. So scientists have discovered that when your glucose levels are low, the craving center in your brain activates. Mm -hmm. And this is a part in our brain that is in charge of cravings. And when your glucose levels are low, that part activates and tells you like, Scott, you got to find something sweet to eat, right? And that system, it's really hard to fight against it. So if you're somebody who has cravings, they're probably not your fault. It might be just your brain's reaction to glucose levels that are too low, that are going too low. And that's really just, you know, an evolutionary ancestral reaction of that particular craving center of your brain. Of course, when your glucose are, is low, that's not the only thing that happens, but that's one of the consequences. So if you avoid the spikes, you then avoid such a strong drop that can lead to more cravings. I've heard adults say that and people who don't have diabetes, so they're not using man-made insulin, they'll say, I feel like my blood sugar is low. But then you test them and they're not. Is that the craving, do you think? Yeah. So that's another thing. There's so many things. So that's probably, so, you know, when you have diabetes, you're familiar with the concept of reactive hypoglycemia, right? So like you spike and then when your glucose drops below baseline, and even in people without diabetes, that can actually happen, of course, to a lesser extent, but you can still feel that drop and that craving, but it can also lead to things like nausea, sweats, palpitations, you know, even with people without diabetes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a combination of so many things. And when people say, I have low blood sugar. Actually, what they don't know is that this is not a condition they were born with, right? What they don't know is that actually those symptoms are probably caused by just a very short-lived crash after a spike. It, this is two things. It's funny you use the phrasing because my daughter, when she was younger, the only way she could describe, uh, she, she would say, I could feel the fall. So she would know that she was going to be low before any testing actually indicated that yeah. she was low. And she would say, I wow. could feel it falling. Um, but you, what you just said, not to jump around, but what you just said made me wonder, is this why when you hear people, and I've done it too, forget people, like you go on a very low carb, like high protein, high fat diet, and you suddenly you're like, I feel so much better. But is that just because your your glucose is very stable like that? It's a very, it's a, it's probably one of the main reasons. Yeah. Because a lot of symptoms are caused by being on a glucose roller coaster. The studies show us that 
80% of people without diabetes can still be experiencing this roller coaster on a daily basis, right? right? And those leads to many symptoms. So one, it's because you're not having the roller coaster anymore. So you don't get all these crazy symptoms. And two, your body's just functioning better because with, with fewer spikes, your mitochondria are just like, you know, humming along really well. They're able to make energy efficiently. A lot of things fall into place when you're able to steady your glucose levels a bit more than they were before. Is there any value to the idea that when you don't overtax one part of your system, that there's more to go around for the other parts, for your other systems as well? Like, like, do you know what I mean? Like when you're sitting in, I don't know, convalescing after you have an injury or something like that, like your body's trying, it's putting a lot of effort towards one thing. I don't know. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm reaching a little bit, but like, I also think that, um, I've eaten, like I said, I've eaten low carb before and sort of just aches and pains go away. Yeah, uh, inflammation like, inflammation reduces. Right. So many so many symptoms get better when we don't give such, you know, violent influxes of glucose through the way that we're eating. Okay. So so many things aging also slows down. Mm -hmm. Fewer spikes you have, the slower you're aging. Like there's just the the consequences are um come by the dozen. So yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that somebody who's on a low carb diet and who's learning and to manage their glucose levels that they would see so many symptoms get better. But also like I'm not necessarily a proponent of going super low carb and not eating any starches or any sugars anymore. I just don't think that's really realistic. And for a lot of people, at least for me, like that's not really what I want to do. You Jesse, know? you and I are getting I, along great because my next question yeah. was going to be, but all that doesn't sound very realistic to me. So how do we? <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound super realistic. And of course, you know, in some instances, it makes a lot of sense. Like for right. sure, if you want to do it and if it works for you, like go for it. But it's just difficult. And then it's a bit of a like zero one approach to it all like either i don't eat any carbs or i'm not on the diet like what about we learn some principles that allow us to eat whatever we want mm -hmm. in a way that's better for our glucose and our health and so you know that's that's where all the hacks come in so we talked about savory breakfast super important that'll really sort you out for the day and then if you love your sweet breakfast foods and sweet foods it's totally fine you can have them but remember as dessert after lunch or after dinner, mm -hmm. not first thing in the morning when you're fasted, because that way you're not going to create such a big glucose spike that's going to stay with you all day. Can I so ask that, one more breakfast question? Yeah. So, sure. so if a person, because I went onto my Facebook group before you and I came on, I should find yeah. this for you, and um, and I said, uh, hey, everybody, real quick, tell me all the meals that you have trouble bolusing for. Okay. And um. Let me see. It was an hour and a half ago. Let me see where we're at now. Because I'm thinking of one that I saw specifically uh, where the person said that their child eats a fairly savory breakfast except puts potatoes with it. Mm. And then their blood sugar stays high all day long and yeah. they have trouble getting it down. So they're eating bacon or eggs or something to that effect, but then yeah. also some a potato along with it. So you can't just what what it's making me think back on is um the first time that I found the Atkins diet. Like I'm old, you know what I mean? So years ago. And it, it was in your head that if you ate very low carb, you'd go into ketosis, not the ketosis like diabetic ketoacidosis, but ketosis. And but it's but you could eat that way all day long and you had this feeling like well any of the fat that I'm taking in is going to just pass through me so it's okay. And then you make one slip up during the day and I would think, well, one slip up equals ruining this whole day for me. Mm. And I would kind of consider it that way. And I'm wondering if adding the potatoes to the breakfast isn't the same idea. Like overwhelmingly, the breakfast is going to put you off on the right foot. But once you grab a couple of these potatoes, you're shot. Is that kind of the feeling or no? I, w I would say no. I think it's more about like balance, right? Okay. So what about you kind of like have one less potato and one more egg and kind of find that balance until you're able to still have some starchy foods that you like. Good. Um, but you might actually use another hack, which could solve this problem. The other hack is eating your food in the right order. Mm -hmm. So that's very powerful. So if this person is starting the breakfast by eating the potatoes, that will cause a much bigger spike than if they ate the potatoes last. Okay. You can eat the exact same food, the exact same meal, but if you have, this is what the science, what science has found, if you have 
fiber, proteins, and fats at the beginning and starches and sugars at the end, you can reduce the spike of that meal by up to 75% wow. without changing the meal you're eating, like and, without changing the actual yeah, foods. Yeah, and I, I know we've been clear, but I'll say again, this is a study done with people who have a functioning pancreas, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. but still the the – the lesson from it should be very mm -hmm. valuable, I would think. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, so all the hacks I share, some studies have been done in people with a functioning pancreas. Some studies have been done in type one and type two. Like there's actually a lot of replication going on. And the food order study has been studied in type two. I can't recall off the top of my head if it's been done in type one, but I'll look it up for you. Well, but the principles stay the same. Yeah. What I can right? tell you is that through the years being in the space for the years and hearing people talk, whether it's a study that's been done or not, it is passed around like campfire folklore, like eat it in this order, your blood sugar won't. I've heard people say that for a decade. They mm -hmm. didn't have any science behind it other than their own trial and error. But mm -hmm. I've been hearing people talk like that for a long time. And that's so interesting because a lot of the stuff that we're now sort of understanding more deeply with the scientific studies have been knowledge that's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it's cultural, like, for example, another hack we can talk about is vinegar and how when you have vinegar at the beginning of a meal, it helps reduce the spike of that meal. So many cultures have been having vinegar for centuries. And now we kind of understand why it's so helpful specifically on your glucose levels. It's interesting. I, I imagine you must find yourself in the position of over-explaining because some of the things feel... Um, I don't, I'm trying to, I know I'm trying to figure out a, like a, a word that will mean something to you culturally, but it feels crunchy, uh, a mm -hmm. little granola. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, yeah. oh, just drink vinegar. Everything will be fine. Like, no, I, like love oh, yeah. I love it. Right. I don't find it to be over expanding. Like my, my job is I'm, you know, I teach stuff. I share science. So I will explain everything as deeply as you want to go. And I find it really fun and fascinating. Well, well then so you why, want me to dive into yeah, why would that help something? I was just waiting for you to ask Scott. I was just <laughs> setting you up perfectly. So you could be like, why does vinegar work? <laughs> okay. So vinegar contains a molecule called acetic acid. Mm -hmm. Acetic acid is very cool. Acetic acid does a few things to your glucose levels. So number one, when you have some vinegar before a meal, the acetic acid in that vinegar is going to hang around in your stomach, and there it's going to slow down how quickly starches break down to glucose. So if you have a little bit of vinegar and some water before some pasta, for example, that pasta is then going to break down into glucose more slowly. So it's going to arrive in your bloodstream more slowly. So it's going to be less of a sharp increase and more of a sort of steadier rise. Mm -hmm. So that's quite interesting. Number two, acetic acid goes to your muscles and it tells your muscles to soak up more glucose than they usually would. So as a result, you have these two things going on of glucose arriving in the bloodstream more slowly and your muscles soaking it up more quickly. So it's pretty, you know, it's pretty amazing in the studies. You see really the impact that that has on the glucose spike of a meal. Yeah. Super powerful, quite easy to try out and um, cheap. And you don't have to change what you're eating. Yeah. So that's that's a nice, a nice one to try out. Have you ever heard, uh, this is one that goes through the diabetes community. I wonder if you've ever heard about it. Cook pasta, eat it hot, hits your yep. blood sugar very hard. Cook pasta, refrigerate it, reheat it, does not hit yep. you as hard. Why is it's that? It's true. It's because when you cook starches, so it can be bread, pasta, rice, potatoes, and then you cool them down, some of the starch in that food is going to transform into something called resistant starch, which essentially is like fiber. So it's like, it's as if you're increasing how much fiber there is in that pasta or in that potato mm -hmm. by cooking it and cooling it all the way down. And then once it's done that, it only does that once. You can then reheat it, cool it down as many times as you want. You can eat it however you want. That transformation will be locked in. Yeah. So it's very awesome. Su I love that one. Sunday night, my wife said, wouldn't you love pasta with turkey meatballs for dinner? Which I took to mean you should make pasta and turkey meatballs for dinner. <laughs> and so I did that. And for simplicity, just for description, we use uh, a brand, Dream Fields pasta because we've just learned over time that it hits my daughter's blood sugar easier, right? So we already have what I'm 
calling a lower glycemic pasta. The sauce is just me taking whole tomatoes and throwing in some garlic, right? There's not much to it. And the turkey meatballs are just ground turkey. Two hours after we ate, my stomach was uneasy. I expect that. The the digestive enzymes help me from having, I can't believe, I I don't know why I started a podcast, Jesse, so I can tell people things I don't want anybody to know. (laughs) But the digestive enzymes kept me from having a bathroom emergency, which Mm -hmm. I would have had if I just ate it straight. But I was still a little uneasy. But I'm also cheap, and I made a lot of pasta. So every day this week, I've had some pasta with a meal. I have not felt uneasy in the ensuing days, just on the first day. Amazing. I love that. That's resistant starch working for you. Another thing you might try, and this is another hack, and it's probably one of my favorites, is at the beginning of a meal, start your meal with a little plate of vegetables. I call this the veggie starter. Mm -hmm. So it can be, you know, any kind of veggies you like. Maybe it's a few cherry tomatoes from the fridge because that's what you have. Maybe it's some leftover roasted, I don't know, cauliflower. Maybe it's a bit of spinach. Like when you have vegetables first at the beginning of a meal, and this goes back to the food order thing. The fiber in those veggies is going to coat your digestive system and really protect you and help you not absorb glucose too quickly afterwards. Mm -hmm. So that might be another one that helps you if the resistant starch helps you as well. I love the veggie starter one. Like it's a non-negotiable for me anymore. It feels like a, a natural way of doing what, you know, about 15 years ago, there was a big push, um, do you remember this, Olestra? There was going to be a drug that kept fat from being um, digested and it would oh, pass wow. through you, What, which just made very like explosive oily stools for people. <laughs> but but it, it was it, it's what popped into my, I'm older, so it's what popped into my head was the idea of like coating your system so that yep. some things don't get, yep. yeah, but, but in more this naturally. case, you know, we're not talking about a, a drug. drug, we're talking yeah. about something that all of us should always have. Like we should always have that mesh that's protecting our intestines. But Hmm. most of us don't because we just eat so differently nowadays. And so by adding that veggie starter in, you're kind of working hand in hand with your body to prepare your body for that meal. Um, It's a a really lovely one. So I'm going to ask you a question, but first I'm going to tell you something uh, so you know why I'm asking. Don't judge me, okay? Um, I don't eat vegetables. Is there anything I can do supplementally to help that? Yes. So there are a few supplements that can help. You can take some, actually right now, the best thing you can do is take some fiber supplements. Really? Or you can make yourself a little like, would you drink a little bit of water with like some ground flax seeds in it? Maybe. I do a green drink in the morning. I don't want to say the brand because they're a sponsor. Yeah. But um, I do. And by the way, you said something earlier that really struck me. When I started doing the green drink right away in the morning, not only did I, I, first I thought I was just feeling hydrated because I'm, I'm bad at remembering to drink water. So at least I'm taking like these 16 ounces of water right away in the morning. That's I thought well, maybe I'm just feeling the hydration, but I have to tell you, like I miss the green drink on some days and I notice I didn't have it. And I, I, I can't say why, right? I just know that I feel, I'm going to use a weird word, crisper. Like yeah. a little more Your upright. Your brain is a bit sharper, maybe. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, absolutely. Um, but okay, so I could do like a, I'm sorry, like a fiber, like right before the meal. Yeah. Um, could I do like a tablet of like a like a capsule, or would I want to do it could, mixed up in a water? You could do both, really. You could do, um, you could do a little capsule of like psyllium husk or like some pretty standard like little fiber supplements. You could do a little, you could create a little, your own little Scott fiber cocktail with some like, you know, ground flax seeds, ground chia seeds that can actually help quite a bit. And then if you don't really want to do any of those things, you can all also just start your meal by a little bit of protein and fat. So like half an egg or, you know, something to just coats your stomach before you're going to take in, for example, pasta or any other starches. You really want to think about preparing your body so that the impact of the meal you're going to have is going to be a bit dampened. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is with fiber from veggies. But even if you want to do it with some protein or some fat, that's still going to help rather than doing nothing. I just realized we're having too good of a time. Are you stuck to an hour or can we keep going? Oh, no, we can keep going. Okay, great. Um, 
All right, so g- let's get get me through more of your hacks. You just you did the veggies first. I got savory breakfast, yeah. veggies first. Savory what else? breakfast, Vinegar. veggies first. We talked about if you want to eat something sweet, have it at after a meal, not on an empty stomach. That's super important. Mm-hmm. Now let's talk about your muscles. So another hack is after a meal, use your muscles for 10 minutes. So that can be walking for 10 minutes. That, that could be my new favorite thing, which is, okay, do it with me, Scott. So your feet are on the ground. And you're going to lift your, um, I can't even explain this. You're going to do like a calf raise. Okay. So you're going onto your tippy toes and your calves are working and okay. you go up and down and up and down. I That's got it. a calf raise. Yeah. Yeah. And so your calf has this really cool muscle in it called the soleus muscle, which is very good at uptaking glucose from the bloodstream. It's very hungry for glucose. And so when you do these calf raises like this, you're going to be pulling glucose out of the circulation and into that calf muscle. And it's going to reduce the spike that you're experiencing from a meal. Super easy. You can do it at work, sitting down. Nobody needs to know. Uh, But any kind of movement after a meal is going to help lower that blood sugar because your muscles, when they contract, they need glucose for energy. How long would I do these calf raises for? So in the studies, I think they do them for three hours, which I don't recommend. I'm not doing um, that. I was, <laughs> 10 minutes is good. Okay. Right? So just kind of like put a little timer on your phone or whatever. And you don't have to be super crazy about them, right? You, mm-hmm. you can just think, okay, I'm doing a few like maybe 10, you know, calf raises per minute for like 10 minutes. Right. But even if you just do one, that's better than not doing any. Okay. So it's really up to you. I think 10 minutes is a really good amount to see a big difference. But even just one is already calls for celebration. Oh, wow. Okay. So all right, So I don't have type one, but I'm still going to yeah. try it. Do you think I'm going to uh, listen just for like, I was going to say shits and giggles. I don't know if that's a French term that would like get to you or not. But um, but just for fun, I'm, next time my daughter f- f- finds herself with a sticky blood sugar, I'm yeah. going to say just for fun, do 10 minutes of calf raises sitting down. Absolutely. I want to see what happens. I'm going to be Absolutely. interested to see. And walking is also very powerful. Well, of course, yeah. Very, very powerful. You know that. But it requires a whole organization and somewhere to walk. So calf raises are really good. The study is very interesting. That's crazy. There was a, a decade ago, a gentleman that did something in the type 1 community where he just wanted to promote exercise. So he had people record their glucose, go for a walk, come back, record it again. And people saw 50-point drops in their blood sugars and stuff like that. So we're always yeah. telling people, even just the idea of – um that it, that's kind of two prong for a type one, by the way, the way you're describing is just creating a, a, a situation where the muscle pulls the glucose in, which is part of what you get out of exercise. But the secondary thing you get when you have type one is the distribution of the insulin through your system. When you're sedentary, you need more insulin because it just doesn't work as effectively effectively. So you get people up and you get them moving. And sometimes they'll say exercise makes me drop, but really what they should be thinking maybe a little bit is that exercise makes my insulin work better. I see. You know, so it's an, yeah. it's an interesting hair to split, you know. Makes it, sense. Yeah. Okay. All right. So calf raises. I mean, yeah. do, you, do you have more? Or because calf raises seems like that would be the crazy <laughs> one at the end. But go ahead. <laughs> um, let's do one last one. Okay. Uh, this one is called put some clothing on your carbs. So don't eat any carbs naked. So what I mean by this is, so carbs are starchy foods so like bread pasta rice potatoes or sweet foods so that can be anything from a piece of fruit to like candy to the chocolate things that you like in the can those are carbs if we eat them naked the glu- and carbs contain glucose that's really important right carbs break down to glucose when we digest them so if we have them on their own which is what i call naked then boom as i explained the glucose goes really quickly through your digestive system and into your bloodstream and big spike What we want to do instead is learn to put some clothing on them. So Mm -hmm. clothing are proteins, fats, or fiber. When you add some clothes, I'm going to give you some examples. And when you add some clothes to your carbs, you reduce the spike that they create. So for example, let's say you want to have a piece of toast. You have two options. You can have the toast naked, which is going to create a bigger spike than adding, let's say, a slice of ham to the toast or half a mashed avocado, which is fat to the toast, right? So think about dressing your carbs and not letting them run around naked. Mm -hmm. Another good example would be you're at a birthday party. You want to have a slice of cake. The cake on its own, that's just naked carbs. Add to it a few spoonfuls of Greek yogurt 
or add to it maybe like a handful of nuts, right? You want to have some pasta for dinner. Add to it a little bit of spinach. I know you don't eat vegetables, but for people who eat vegetables, like a little bit of spinach, some leftover roasted broccoli, a bit of chicken, you know, some meatballs. Like think about not letting your carbs get into your body naked. Mm -hmm. That'll help steady your glucose levels. So to put context to this for people listening who have type 1, if your blood sugar starts to get low and you need a quick infusion of glucose, you eat simple sugars, right? Stuff that your body can absorb very quickly. And you'll find after a while, as a matter of fact, emergency like gel, you just rub in the lining of your cheeks because it's so easy to pull glucose in through your cheeks, right? Um, you would not you would not get into a panic situation where your blood sugar was changing rapidly going down and say, oh, I'm going to eat peanut butter to fix it. Like, that won't work. You want juice. You want simple sugars that get pulled up quickly. And so you just sort of reverse engineer that idea, right? Don't allow your body to just have those simple sugars and you won't see the big spike, even though you've taken in the same thing. So you really do believe there's a way to eat what people want to eat without getting into a situation where your body craves it in an overindulgent way and it's not impacting your blood sugars in a way that is damaging the way you described earlier. That's doable. Absolutely. And I think that's why, you know, my my message and my work has been so popular is because this is not about cutting out food groups. This is about learning to eat the things you love in a way that still helps your body Mm -hmm. do its best and that's just how i want to live my own life yeah. you know i don't when i learned that glucose spikes were triggering these mental health episodes in me my first thought was like i can't i can't ever eat glucose ever again mm -hmm. you know but then i was like no i don't want to live like that let me figure out how i can eat everything i love with less impact on my body so See. yes i do believe it's possible and i have actually a lot of readers who have type one who by using the hacks have been able to learn so much about how their body responds to food yeah. and have been able to incorporate what they love in a, in a different way. Well, I think it's very important. It's why I reached out to you and you and I don't know each other well, but um, I think that's why my podcast is popular too, because I looked at this problem and I said, how do I keep my daughter's life not feeling restricted at all and yet not give away her health over it? And so I focused on how to use insulin and then figured it out, and then figured out a way to simply explain it to other people. And then these people are having these these things too. And then those people give me the gift of finding you and then saying, hey, you have to go find this girl, Jessie. And I was like, okay. So I went and I thought, oh, this is great. And just the idea, like you and I are doing the same thing from two different perspectives. We're thinking yeah. about where the impacts are coming from and how we can head them off. That yes. really is it, right? Yes, and how we can minimize, you know, harm in a way. Um, for me, it's really important to, you know, in in the world of people with a functioning pancreas, something you often might see is like people going on extreme diets, or people feeling really upset at their body, or uh, feeling a lot of guilt around cravings, and just these relationships to food that become distorted. And I, I try to teach people how food actually scientifically, biochemically impacts their body, and teaching them these hacks shows them that they can eat whatever they love. And still help their health at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm really such a strong believer in that message of like, you can have both. You just need the right information to be able to do it. And this would likely va be valuable to people with type 2 diabetes, right? It, Absolutely. Yeah. Because type 2 diabetes, in most cases, you can put it into remission. In most cases. And you can reverse pre-diabetes. Type 2 diabetes can get better. If you have type 1, your numbers can get better when you learn more about how food impacts your glucose levels, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, there are things you can, as you know very well, there are hacks and solutions and strategies you can put in place to, to help your body. Um, and yeah, I see many people who reverse put type 2 diabetes in remission after reading my book and applying the science that I share. I have to say how grateful I am for a, a, the podcast format, because this is a thing that once it's, you know, you, you, you let it breathe and you have a long conversation and you think, okay, well, that makes sense. You just said something like, how could I, as a person, with, if I'm a person with type one diabetes, how could I do some of these things that might help my blood sugar spikes and therefore make my day less variable? I might feel better, all these things that'll come with it. And the problem is if you don't have a, 
like a slow, easy conversation about this. It turns into, I saw somebody on Instagram and they said, if I drink vinegar, I, I don't know. I think they said it cures my diabetes. And then that makes people angry because obviously that's not true. And then we get caught in this sort of like social media storm instead of just listening and saying, what would it hurt for me to try a couple of these things to see if it helps? You're not here saying like, drink vinegar and I'm going to get taller magically and I'll be prettier and my blood sugar will be perfect. You're like, here's the function of this. Give it a shot. See if it helps you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm just trying to communicate this science because when I first started diving into the science of glucose, I was like, wow, there's all these amazing papers and discoveries and nobody knows about this stuff. Nobody, I mean, not enough, you know? And so I just wanted to give essentially the scientific discoveries more of a voice. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that Instagram and social media formats is is really not good enough. And that's why I wrote books, you know, and that's why I love doing podcasts is because I feel like that's a much better way to, to yeah. teach and to learn. And for me, the Instagram is more like the trailer. And then if you want to see the movie, you have to you have mm -hmm. to dive deeper, you know. I try to give as much information as I can on every single Instagram post, but you can never add all the nuance and the context. It's important to... Uh, to have other platforms where you can really get into it. Yeah, I, I have a similar feeling where I think at least I know if I put it down like this, the people who made it through it, they at least heard everything I wanted for them to hear. I, a like on a post or something, I don't know if they read that or they understood it or if it was a scroll and like, oh, I like Scott, tap, tap. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like that kind of thing. Um, and so I, I appreciate you doing this. I have m many more questions, but, um, but I want you to first talk about because I think this is a good opportunity to uh, stop some outrage that isn't necessary. Can you explain to people how valuable it is to have a continuous glucose monitor to help figure these things out, even if you don't have diabetes? So I would just, you know, caution that by saying I don't tell everybody to wear a glucose monitor. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's a, a medical device and it's you know, if you're not, if you don't have a care system around you or a doctor to talk to, it can be really confusing to understand the numbers. What I think is very valuable is for everybody to learn how food impacts glucose and learn these hacks to manage it, even if they don't have diabetes. Yeah. I think the most pressing thing that's going on right now is that more and more females are experiencing infertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, you know, a lot of issues around the hormonal systems, even if you don't have diabetes. I think it's now one in eight females have polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a complete dysregulation of your sex hormones. And that's very linked to glucose and to insulin. And so that's why when you learn to steady your glucose levels, if you have PCOS, your symptoms usually get much better. And that's mm -hmm. why I hear stories, you know, every week of women who had been told they would never be able to get pregnant naturally, who after using the hacks, get their period back or able to conceive. Like this is important that we're talking about, yeah. you know. And then even if you don't have type one, type two is a growing epidemic. There's a billion people in the world who have prediabetes or type two. And so preventing that needs to be a top priority for everybody. And in order to prevent that, you have to learn about your glucose levels and how they work. Mm -hmm. And then, as we mentioned, you know, Alzheimer's, mental health, brain fog, energy levels, like 80% of the population who doesn't have type 1 diabetes is still probably experiencing glucose spikes. That's yeah. what the studies show. So we can all benefit and we all have glucose in our bodies. And it, you know, learning how to manage it is just such a foundational piece of being able to to thrive. And so I just, I think it's so important that everybody knows about this. Right. Well, it's, mm -hmm. you know, I only brought it up because people get upset when they see somebody using a CGM because they feel like it's taking one from somebody who's using man-made insulin. And I, I'm not, not, I understand where that feeling comes from. Mm -hmm. And, but I like what I heard you say is like, okay, so maybe if I wore one once, I could see how things impact me. If I don't have diabetes, I don't need to keep wearing it. I now have that information. And now I can just use these hacks to try to impact those things. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. like, I understand, you know, at the beginning of my work, I was posting a lot of selfies of myself with a glucose monitor. Like, I didn't understand that that was triggering. Mm -hmm. And then I had some amazing people with type 1 reach out to me and being like, hey, Jesse, like, I don't know you, but I just want you to know, like, for our community, this does not feel good. Can you please change what you're doing? And I was like, yeah, of course. And then yeah. I had other type 1s come to me and say, oh, my God, now that I see you wearing a glucose monitor and you don't even have type 1, I feel less... Like, uh, you know, embarrassed about wearing a glucose monitor. For some people, that's a feeling as well. So, yeah. so many things are true. And I think I've found a line where 
I use the glucose monitor to create the graphs that illustrate the scientific studies. Mm -hmm. I use the glucose monitor to be able to create these visuals that are so key in teaching people about how their bodies work. And if you go to my Instagram, glucose goddess, you'll see what I mean. Like those graphs are fundamental to the education of it all. Listen, those but graphs. Listen, I'm always learning. Huh? Yeah, those glad. I, I, I'm going to tell you just, with, you know, I used to be very good at managing insulin and then glucose monitors came and I got really, really good at it. And then algorithms came along, which are making decisions about insulin back and forth and watching them work up my game again, just seeing the different impacts and seeing where the insulin comes in and seeing where the, where the spike or the low happens. I, I sent my daughter a text last night. She's in college. She's not, she's 700 miles from here and I'm getting in bed last night and I look at her blood sugar before I go to bed and I sent her a text and I said, if you were to eat two gummy bears right now. Her blood sugar was 110. I said, you're going to avoid a, le a low in about 45 minutes. And she, of course, is 18 and doing her homework. And she ignores me, which I understand. And about 45 minutes to an hour later, her blood sugar dipped under 70. And I sent a text and I said, I don't know if you saw my last text, but um, <laughs> and and I'm I'm not teasing her. I'm hoping that she pulls up the graph and thinks, what did this old man see an hour ago? about this graph that made him know this was going to happen. I, I just wanted to learn kind of slowly, you know, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to say something to you now. I'm, I can't wait to see the look on your face. Cause part of me thinks if you know about this, you're going to be like, Oh my God, I can't believe you know this too. Um, my daughter began to take Ovacetol last year, which has Inositol in it, I N O S I T O L. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And is it did not say it for me? I don't know how you say it actually. All right. Well, between us, it's N I O. I know in French, but I don't know the American English version of it. So my daughter starts to get her period, and yeah. it's incredibly heavy. It is happening too long, sometimes eleven days, and sometimes she only gets a two or three day gap before it starts up again. Mm. Once a month, she gets a nosebleed one time horrible for a couple of minutes. This happens to her for years, so much so that her her iron drops so low we have to get her iron infusions. Like she's Oof. like just dripping in a pile in a puddle, you know. Um a number of years ago we started using an integrative endo from around here to help Arden with her she also has um a thyroid issue. So she's hypothyroid. And that person helped her get her thyroid all balanced out and then we just kept talking and kept seeing her. And one day she said, I really think, like we've looked at so many things, I think a lot of the things your daughter's experiencing are hormonal. And try this. So now she takes like a heaping scoop of this and dissolves it in water once a day. Normal periods, uh, not too heavy, not too long, no more That's nosebleed, wild. crazy, right? That's wild. Um, she comes home from college for a break, kind of loses track of her um, her schedule for a couple of weeks. Um, dad, I don't feel good. My period's mm -hmm. too heavy. Boom. She gets a nosebleed. I'm like, have you been taking the Ovacetol every day? And she goes, no. Starts it back up again. A month later, she's okay again. Fascinating. Like really, mm -hmm. like, I think we saved her life with it too. Like wow. she was in a, dis and it, it's, it's, a, it's again, it's one of those things that I think if you just bumped into it somewhere, you'd be like, some hippie told me about a thing I put in water and it makes my period better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's hard to like. I would have been that person 20 years ago. Like, honestly, if you would have come to me and said, I don't know, Scott, put the vegetables before the this, I'd be like, uh-oh. <laughs> but now I hear it and I think, God damn, that all makes sense to me, yeah. you know? so It's so fascinating, all the things that you come across in your life, right? And then you just want to share those. And maybe in 10 years in Ossetal, everybody will know about it. And I hope also the veggie thing, everybody will be like, oh yeah, we know to eat your veggies first. Like Jesse, like shut up. And I hope I don't have a job anymore. I just hope all this stuff becomes yeah. super common knowledge. I have that thought sometimes. Like I, I tell people that I, I I think that the goal of the podcast is that you don't have to listen to it anymore. Yeah, and you want to become irrelevant. Yeah. Same for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, 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 I keep thinking like, like, I don't want this to be your life. This should be a pit stop, not the whole thing, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. kind of idea. All right. I so, all right. So now I think we've laid out pretty clearly the stuff that you talk about, right? I am, and I'm going to ask about, we're going to try to talk through, maybe, maybe we can go for 20 more minutes to talk through how it might work for people with diabetes. But first, tell me, you said you had a book, you have more than one, right? 
Yeah. So my first book came out last year. It's called Glucose Revolution. And in it, I talk about all the basics of the science and the hacks and how it impacts. I have stories of people in it who have type one, who don't have type one. There's lots of cool stuff in it. And I have a new book that's out now that's called The Glucose Goddess Method. And that's basically a four-week guide to actually doing some of these glucose hacks that I've been talking about. It's like a fast track to turning the hacks into habits. And it has a bunch of recipes and it has a whole week about veggie starter recipes, Scott. So okay. you could actually maybe find a veggie starter recipe that you actually like. Oh, in an, I just recorded it. So uh, Jenny and I are making a type two series right now. Yeah. And so we're in the middle of recording it. It hasn't been out. It's not out yet. And in the middle of it, I was like, you have to imagine I I've I have a, a real relationship with this person, you know. And I in the middle of it, I'm like, oh god, Jenny, I don't eat vegetables. And, and she's like, wait, what? And I'm like, I, I don't. And I, by the way, I went into it there. It's not important here, but I grew up poorly, and you know, I was I grew up in one of those situations where I was like eat these, and they were like crappy French green beans out of a can. I didn't want them. I didn't like the way they felt in my mouth. I'm very tactile about food. That's not a thing anyone understood in the 70s. I'll tell you that right now. And then my parents would be like, you're eating that or you're not eating anything else. And mm -hmm. I just, like the idea of eating vegetables now is uh, probably as psychological a problem as anything else for me. Interesting. Um, and the coffee thing is psychological too, right? Yeah. I don't, I, my, my parents drank so much coffee that the house smelled like it. Wow. And then it was this, again, 70s and 80s, like we, we lived in an apartment. My dad smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. I, I'm surprised I'm alive, y yeah. you know, and um, those are just things I don't I don't want because of that. I um, understand. Yeah, it, it's interesting. So, okay, so I'm going to tell you something and then we're going to see if we can't build a conversation off of it. Tell me. People with type 1 diabetes often have a lot of trouble bolusing for pizza, Mm -hmm. So they'll count the car. The, the initial mistake is they count up all the carbs, they put in all the insulin, and then they get very low. Yeah. And then, of course, then they treat the low with something fast acting, then they spike up, then they keep spiking up, and it stays that way for hours. Yeah. Before they understand that what happened was that the pizza has cheese on it. And so you, uh, I can't wait to say this to you to see if you agree. So you eat the pizza. Your body kind of, the digestion gets slowed by the cheese or any meat that might be on it. And so the dough of the pizza sort of gets pushed off to the side for a little bit, right? It, basically, what you're doing is mm -hmm. you're putting clothes on that dough. Right. And keeping and it from being absorbed. Yeah, exactly. Right. You're slowing down digestion. You're slowing down how quickly food goes from stomach to intestine, then from in intestine to bloodstream. If you ate just the dough of the pizza with nothing else on it, you would get a much faster spike because right. then you would just have carbs. Mm -hmm. But when you add stuff like the fats from the cheese and the proteins, you're putting clothing on that naked carb. So you're slowing down how quickly the glucose is making its way to the bloodstream. And in a type one situation, you've put in a significant amount of insulin for what could be, I mean, a slice of pizza is going to be somewhere around 30 carbs, right? 20 or 30 mm -hmm. carbs. And now you eat two, you've put in, I don't know, say you're one for 10, you know, a unit for 10. Now you've got six units of insulin going for these two slices. And then the digestion doesn't happen. You mm -hmm. crash, you go, oh no, eat a bunch of sugar, spike up, and then as the spike's going up, then the digestion hits, and now your blood sugar's high for hours afterwards. Yeah. So the simple fix is, for some people, and by the way, here's the interesting thing, Domino's pizza, or a hand-tossed pizza from a place up the street, or a pizza I make at home, all have different impacts, right? So it's not just pizzas, pizzas, pizza, but once you figure out where the insulin goes in, so that the so that the the way I talk about it is that you want to match up the action of the insulin with the impact of the carbs, mm. and that man made insulin doesn't work. It's not a light, it's not a light switch, right? You don't put it in; it's just working. You put it in; it starts to work slowly over time. It picks up speed, and then there's an intense part where it's really working hard, and you just have to adjust when the bolus goes in, so that it matches up with that that food impact. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so if you're slowing down the spike of some carbs, right? You also need to slow down how quickly the insulin is arriving into your bloodstream. So mm -hmm. let's take another example. If you're doing like a piece of cake on its own versus cake and Greek yogurt, mm -hmm. right? It is the same number of carbs in both of those 
instances. But in the plus yogurt part, you're also adding fat and protein. Yeah. So the glucose is going to arrive more slowly into your bloodstream. So maybe you would need a different um, strategy insulin-wise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and that's exactly what you end up doing is you just – like most most food takes what – what would be colloquially called a pre-bolus, like putting the insulin in a little before you eat so you can find that matchup. Not all foods, not all people. And there's mm -hmm. also another level of a problem where insulin, uh, thinking about how in man-made insulin work is so, it's sort of like thinking about like a time travel movie. Like it's sort of like what we do now impacts us later, whereas people want to think what's happening now is somehow impacted by now, which it yeah. it very infrequently is. So you you kind of get the idea of people like, look, you got to get the insulin working a little bit so that it's got a little power when the carbs are trying to drive you up and the insulin's trying to drive you down. I tell them that, you know, uh, on a glucose monitor, for example, when you see a stable line when there's food and insulin there, what you're really seeing is the food trying very hard to push up while the insulin's for, trying very hard to push down. And these are two things caught in a battle that neither can win. And because one can't go up and one can't go down, every time, you, every five minutes you see your blood sugar, it just doesn't seem to move, right? It doesn't mean that the reaction's not happening inside. So so this is it, right? So if, if, if somebody's seeing a certain spike from a meal, you think it might be as easy as them reordering their food and that spike might change. And then they're going to need to pay attention to that because they might be making heavy boluses for what they think is going to be a larger spike that might not end up being. So this is very similar to when my daughter started taking the digestive enzymes, um, some meals that were requiring a ton of insulin were suddenly not requiring as much mm. because it was passing through her system more quickly mm. and not getting stuck in the stomach where it was being yes. leached, right? Essentially, it's not just about like what you eat. It's about how you eat it and which, which order, which combination with vinegar before or not. Like it's not just about the number of carbs in a food or in a meal. Mm -hmm. You can, you really have lots of other levers that you can activate to impact how that food is going to okay. impact your glucose levels. So like if you have type one and you're using insulin, like it's really important to, if you're going to try any of these hacks, to be super aware that you might need to adapt things, maybe talk to your doctor to make sure you're, you know, doing it all properly because the changes can be very drastic. Like yeah. if you switch the order of the foods in your meal and you have the veggies first and the carbs last, the impact on your glucose will be vastly different. Hmm. Well, I'm excited to try it. Um, hey. Yeah, don't worry. At the beginning of the episode, you're going to hear me in a very deep voice say that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. <laughs> then I say some other stuff, so we're all good. Uh, <laughs> but... um. Do you have anything that, like, is there anything I haven't asked you about that I should have? Like roads mm. that you like to go down that I, I didn't get you to? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know so much about this topic that, you know, it's it's like you're teaching me stuff, really. Well, no, no, that's ridiculous. But, <laughs> so, um, no, you asked everything. And I, I think what I want to say is, like, in my first book, my my intention was really just to explain to people how food works and what glucose impacts in our body and just kind of give you like a very easy, very um, a fun masterclass in just glucose and what the heck it is and how it impacts us and how we can impact it in return. Um, and so it's it just I just want people to know that my intention is really to teach as much as I possibly can on this topic because it's so important whether you have type one or you don't. And also you're doing a fantastic job. So mm. I'm just happy that we had this chat. I'm glad we met. It is really because of a listener of the podcast who came yes. to me privately and they're like, you really should look at this. And I was like, oh, OK, I will. Um, and then you were kind enough to answer. And um, it's lovely. Let, let me can I go back and ask you something more personal? Yeah. You alluded to, but didn't de dive deep into your mental health earlier yeah. and that it got better. Can you describe where you were and where you are? Oh, for sure. I mean, trigger warning. But um, so after I broke my back, you know, physically, I was fine in a matter of a few months. But then I started getting these really weird feelings of being in a dream or being in a movie. Like everything around me was two dimensional when I looked at my hands I was like, whose hands are these? When I looked in the mirror, it would give me panic attacks because I was like, who is that person? Like I was fully 
not okay. And, you know, I found these different terms like depersonalization felt like it fit quite well what I was experiencing, some dissociation, a lot of anxiety, depression. And I was just like, I cannot live this way. I felt so broken to my core. I felt like my brain was so broken. I couldn't be alone at all. Mm -hmm. Like I could just couldn't take the bus by myself. Like it was impossible. I had to always either be distracting myself with a video game on my phone or be with somebody else. I was terrified and I was not okay for, you know, the better part of a decade. Like I was really not okay. Um, but you know, I just kind of kept going, um, kept at it, but deep down there was something really not okay with, with my brain and seeing that these spikes were triggering some of these episodes really, it completely changed my life. And I'm so thankful that I, f I felt that I wanted to raise my hand and say, yeah, I'll try the CGM for this, you know, experiment thing. Like it just, it gave me so much hope back. I can't imagine if that hadn't happened. Yeah. That's fascinating. where I would be now. Like, f yeah. Wow. And then you layer, so then I fixed my glucose and then I layered on top of that, you know, amazing therapy, EMDR that really helped me. I movement desensitization, reprocessing, like that really helped me a lot. And today I'm actually okay. Like I actually, I can be alone. Mm -hmm. I can travel by myself, which, you know, for most people is like whatever. But for me, like just being able to be in a hotel room by myself for one night is like, I'm like so grateful yeah. that I can do that because I was so not okay. Wow. But oh. ask me any question you want. Like I'm an open book. Oh, that's fascinating. So um, how do you think the injury, do you think the injury led that to that? Or, do you, or did you have any of that prior to the injury? Nothing, nothing prior. I think what happened is that during the accident and then the very intense three weeks pre-surgery and then the surgery where I thought I was going to die, a lot of stress got stuck in my body. Mm-hmm. And nobody taught me how to process it, how to move it. You know, I was just like, I was living in London. Like nobody talked about healing from traumatic experiences or like nervous system. Like just those weren't in my consciousness. So I think my body just held on to so much stress and anxiety and fear. And then if small things happened around me, it would just go full blown into panic mode. Hmm. So I found out that the spikes were one of the things that pushed me over and made me go into full blown panic mode. It's right. as if my baseline was like super broken and then any other extra little stress could put me in a horrible, horrible state. It's interesting because I've been making this podcast. This is the ninth year I've made, I've been making this podcast. Thank you. It was very That's nice. Awesome. Um, and uh, I appreciate that. But I have not heard the, in the first six years, I didn't hear the word anxiety as much as I have heard it in the last three. But I think people always want to like write it off to like, oh, it was COVID or it was this or something. But I don't know. Like, I don't like I'm, I'm having deeper conversations with people. They're being more honest. And that's part of the reason why I think I'm hearing it. But it just makes me wonder about, you know, the, the podcast has listeners because most people have a lot of trouble regu regulating their blood sugars when they're using yeah. insulin, right? Type twos and type ones, and even type twos that don't use insulin, they have trouble with this regulation. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, like after a while, like you start talking to people with autoimmune issues, like you don't know this, but autoimmune issues, or maybe you do kind of run in families and they, they kind of run in groups. Like if you have one, you're more likely to have two, et cetera. The amount of people that come on here and are like, I have Raynaud's and type one and hypothyroidism and this and that. And the next thing you know, they've listed seven issues that they have that are diagnosed that they can feel the impacts from. The amount of people who say that they have a bipolar person in the family and a lot of autoimmune stuff. Um, it just like, I, I, I'm fascinated by how many people tell me I'm anxious or I get easily triggered by things or, you know, like, you know, sometimes when you're in a bubble, you feel like this is the world, but I leave this bubble sometimes. And most people don't talk about stuff like this. And it all feels like it just comes back to, I mean, for me and, and be clear or all that school you went to, I barely got through high school, but it all comes back to me to like, it's inflammation, right? Like it just, that's what it seems like it is that people have autoimmune issues their immune system's going wild and they have inflammation and it's impacting everything from mitochondria in the cells to their wrists hurt. 
you know, or yeah. whatever. Yes. Well, well, I think what's going on is that most of us have bodies that are just in a state of stress, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's biological stress, it's inflammation stress, it's it's stress from the food, from the environment, from just real stress, and the stress causes more stress. And so you get into this cycle where a lot of things can go wrong um, and you can get a lot of various different symptoms. I don't know, you know, why more people are experiencing this, but if you just look, for example, at the type two numbers, I mean, they're going up and up and up and up and up and up, a billion people in the world. I mean, that's wild. And type two is a disease that's caused by food and our food environment. So, I mean, it's crazy, but also I feel very hopeful. I'm like, I don't want people to be in the situation that I was in for a decade, completely yeah. clueless about how I could help myself. Well, yeah, so I think, now, yeah, I was going to say, that's why I was, I was excited by the things you were saying because it's the other part of it, right? Like, I, I, it's not lost on me. There are a lot of people on the planet. We have to feed them all. We've come up with ways to do it. Obviously, some of them are not valuable, like, but they're still producing food in bulk for yeah. people. You, you can't tell people that food's the problem. They, they don't know where to go get more. What are they going to do? Start a farm? You, you know what I mean? Like, like what am I doing? I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm going to, when I get a, get an acre, I'm going to get a cow and a plant. Some, I'm not, I'm going to keep going to the grocery store and keep buying For the sure. stuff that's available to me. For and sure. so giving them the idea that there's at least maybe a way to lessen the impact of, mm -hmm. of these things that they're eating, you know, um, cause I and think also to not fall prey to marketing messages, because often we make food decisions based on what something says on the packaging or, you know, advertising, etc. We have to remember a lot of food products are driven by profit. So we need objective scientific information, which is hard to come by mm -hmm. that helps you understand what's noise and what's real and that's what i'm trying to do i'm trying to be like okay guys like i know the package says like good for your heart or low in this and good for that but like actually here's how your body actually works yeah. like this is what the food turns into and this is how it impacts you and then you have the information and you're empowered and mm. then you can start making decisions on the go that you understand why you're making them you're not just making them because of what something says on a box when i try to make that point to people i usually use the example of uh shaved ice like italian ice like mm. they're always a sign at an Italian ice place that says fat free. Yeah. And I I like I'm like that's hilarious cuz my body's going to turn that sugar into fat in about an hour. <laughs> and yeah. So, right? And but but they're not lying. What's in the cup right now doesn't have any fat in it. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So. so there's a just so there's a lot of misleading marketing and in my first book I also go through like all the things that you might see at the grocery store that are trying to make you buy foods that are actually things you should ignore like this is organic this is gluten free this is fat free this is no sugar added like all that stuff can be abused what you really need to know is what the molecules are what molecules the food contains mm -hmm. And that's what I try to teach people. And then you're empowered for life. Right. And that's really freaking cool. Because I don't want just scientists to know this stuff. Like everybody needs to know this stuff. Because we need to be able to operate and navigate in this crazy food landscape mm -hmm. that we live in. Like we need to know all of this. Yeah, it it, it doesn't say on the package ever, uh, we know some people can't eat gluten. So we've created gluten-free cupcakes. Yeah. But they're so ultra processed, they're really, they have a ton of carbs in them and they're not going to be good for you at all. But there yeah. won't be any gluten in them. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it's, so, and, you know. it, and it's not people's fault. Like, no. I mean, you're everybody's just trying to be healthy and be happy and do what's best for them and their family. Like, my God, we're bombarded with messages. We don't know what's real or not. It's really intense and difficult. Mm. And so I really empathize with that, that just despair of like, what the f am I supposed to eat? Yeah. I, know? This keeps coming up. When when we've been like like I told you, I think I'm like five episodes deep into recording this type two series, and it keeps coming up in conversation where I keep thinking it's no one's fault. Like it's easy to say eat better, exercise more, great. Like what am I supposed to do about that? My it's I got so a, vague, yeah, and so unhelpful. Right, and I got a family of four, and I make thirty five thousand dollars a year. What do you want me to go get a steak and some asparagus? Like where am I getting that from? You, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. I got to feed all these people, and totally. And this is what's it just. Any, anyway, that, that made this whole thing feel uplifting. Would you, I, I hate to do this to you, but at the end here, would you mind yeah. like in a sentence run through each of the hacks again? Of course, of course. Let's do it. Okay. Savory breakfast instead of a sweet one. Very important. If you're going to eat something sweet, have it as dessert after a meal, never on an empty stomach. 
After you eat, use your muscles for 10 minutes. So maybe you go for a walk. Maybe you do some magical calf raises at your desk. Before, At the beginning of a meal, start the meal with vegetables. That's called the veggie starter. And if you can, finish the meal with the carbs. Vinegar, one tablespoon of vinegar in a big glass of water before a meal helps reduce the spike of that meal. And finally, clothes on carbs. So never eat your carbs naked. Always put some protein, fat, or fiber on them. If you want to see a million visual examples of this to actually help you like grasp all these hacks, go to my Instagram, Glucose Goddess, or pick up my new book, The Glucose Goddess Method, full of amazing recipes that will help you actually fast track to turning those hacks into habits. And I'm going to send you a copy, Scott. Jesse, I feel like we're friends. Thank you. We are friends. Uh, no, I, I really like, I don't, like a lot of people come on, you know, and yeah. sometimes they're just like, I'm telling they you about all this suck, thing. But I'm amazing. <laughs> no, no, no. I just, I, I you know what it, it was is that it, it felt like, it felt like you and I are on opposite sides of a mirror saying yep. the same thing just for two yep. different perspectives. Like I'm just yep. talking about it around diabetes and mm -hmm. you should. And so, wow, well, it's just, it's so interesting because and this will sound like this. I don't know how this will sound, but I'm not blowing my own horn, but I, I, I figured this all out by myself. Yeah. And, and I only figured it out, trust me, because it was for my daughter. Yep. And then once I had it, I used to write a blog and the blog yep. was popular but then people stop reading. I don't know what happened to all of you, but you don't like to read anymore. And so um, I was like, well, how do I do this? I almost stopped. Mm. In 2014, I, I almost stopped writing my blog and just gave up. But I knew I was helping people, but they weren't reading anymore. And um, to tell you a weird story, I wrote a book about being a stay-at-home dad. And I found myself uh, on a soundstage in New York being interviewed by Katie Couric. Wow. And when it was over, she grabbed me as I was walking away. And trust me, I was just excited to be there. Like I, I had I had a car home and I was like, oh, I was so excited, oh. you know. And um, I'm just walking away. I'm a little jacked up. And uh, she grabbed me by the shoulder and turned me around. And she said, you're very good at this. And I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, talking to people. She, there were like 500 people here. There were other guests. She's like, you didn't feel it when the others were talking. They were just thinking, let that guy talk again. And, and I said, oh, I didn't know. I said, I did feel them. I had them one time. I said something funny and I watched everybody like go like this. And it's a weird feeling. Like I felt like a magician for a second. Yeah. And I said, okay, thank you. I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, but about a year and a half later, when I started thinking like this blogging is not going anywhere anymore, I thought, oh, I wonder if I, like Katie Kirk did say I was good at talking to people. I was like, maybe I'll start a podcast. And then I got lucky. It was just the first diabetes podcast. So then I kind of was able to build on it. I learned to treat it like a business, not like a hobby. And only by that, I mean, like, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of yes. content, no fluff, like that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And um, and now, like, I used to get, like, one or two letters a, a month from people. And they were like, hey, your blog helps me. And now I get about, like, 20 or 30 a day. Wow. It's super cool. Like, and I think you might be like in a position where you're doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's very Actually, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because neither of us have diabetes, yet we became really fascinated by this topic for different reasons. And um, I think whatever we can do to help people understand their bodies more is just so incredible. And so I'm so happy that you were able to turn it into a business so you can actually keep doing it. And I'm so happy that I now get paid to do this and write books so I can keep doing it too. Yeah. Because it's so important. It's the part that sometimes people don't realize is that if it, I, I always tell them like, look, if the if the podcast didn't have ads, what you wouldn't have is a podcast because I'd exactly. be working somewhere else to pay my bills. And so it's, yep. it's a real it's just a real great moment in time where there's actually access to technology that reaches people and a way to to make it viable for you to be a thing you do. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's really lucky. I actually think it's going to push humanity forward in a lot of ways. Um, much quicker than we could before people could pull their phone out of their pocket and listen to something. It's amazing so. what we can learn these days. Yeah. Yet most of us just look at cat videos on the internet. Not me. <laughs> Not <but> you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to, here, I'll just tell you me. something. I opened up TikTok this morning to check, a, to put a post up. And I just have, I my daughter's roommates in college make videos for the podcast. And then I put oh. them up, right? And um, I went to put one up and I don't know what happened, what came up in front of me. 
But 15 minutes later, I found myself saying, Scott, what are you doing? <laughs> like, put yeah, the video up and get out of this app. Like, you know. It, um, it just pulls you in. It's yeah. so it's so good. It's yeah. so powerful. It's so scary. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, right? Because you either get something. It's like gambling. It's like a slot yeah. machine. It's like it's either get smart. something you want or you so get something and you think, ooh, the next one will be better. Hey, and what's that molecule that happens? When Dopamine. Yeah. I brought it back around, you know Jesse. Everything. Don't worry. <laughs> I, I, I completed the circle. <laughs> All right. You were really lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. First, I'm going to thank AG1, athleticgreens.com forward slash juice box. Get a green drink that you can actually drink. And of course, Omnipod, makers of the Omnipod Dash and the Omnipod 5. Get started. Find out more. All the things you need to do are doable at omnipod.com forward slash juice box. When you use my links, you are supporting the production of the show and keeping it free and plentiful. And last but not least, I want to thank Jessie. Check out her new book, The Glucose Goddess Method, available right now on Amazon or wherever you get your books. And Jessie is on the Instagram if you're looking for her. You want me to tell you where? Hold on a second. You would think. I would have had this information prior to making this recording, but <laughs> I did not. Instagram, Jesse is at Glucose Goddess. It's that simple. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of my award winning podcast. It's not really an award winning podcast. Do you know why it's not an award winning podcast? Actually, this just came up the other day. Do you have a second? I mean, of course you do, right? Um, you're just going to move to another podcast or clean the house or something, go for a walk. You've got a minute. Somebody said to me recently, this podcast, uh, talking about a different podcast, they say it's an award-winning podcast. And I said, well, yeah, all you have to do to win an award is enter into some sort of contest and win it. And there are many contests that no one enter into. So say you're the only aardvark pruning. Do they prune aardvarks? No. Let's try something else. Let's say you're the only sheep shearing podcast in the world and you submit your sheep shearing podcast and no one else does. Then you win and you're an award winning podcast. Just like that. I don't need to win an award. I've already won my award. Do you know what it is? It's all of you. It's the great way that you embrace the show, listen, download, and share it with others. That's all the award I need. If you ever see that this is an award-winning podcast, I got really desperate or really bored one day. Anyway, thanks again for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. By the way, I wrote a book a long time ago. It won an award. Do you know how it won an award? My publisher sent it out for awards and it won an award. I think it's like the month here. This is embarrassing. Hold on. I'll find it for a second. Life is short. Laundry is eternal. Not a bad title. Award. Oh, yeah, here it is. It won the... <laughs> this is hilarious. But what it does, I don't, I don't want to give away the farm. What it does is it puts a big gold seal on the cover online. It's an award-winning book, you know. It's all bullshit. Um... The 2013 Mom's Choice Award winner. Life is Short, Laundry is Eternal. Confessions of a Stay-at-Home Dad by Scott Benner. An award-winning book. <laughs> award-winning podcast. Get the f*** out of here.